the inaugural director of the Lahe Omidyar Mir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto. I welcome you to another inspiring session of our weekly Elahe Omidyar Mir Jalali seminar series, Iranian Cinema, which I am co-convening with Professor Gulbarg Rekab Talai and Dr. Khater Shaybani. At the outset, I'd like to express our collective gratitude to Canada's indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Bandots, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to teach and learn on their ancestral homeland. Dr. Claire Cooley is our speaker today. She is a postdoctoral fellow at Tufts University and her research and teaching focuses on film and media industries in the global South, 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 media flows, sound, sound studies, and critical infrastructure studies. Her work has appeared in a range of publications, including Film History, Jump Cut, and Spectator. Her current book project tells the interconnected history of cinema in the Middle East and South Asia from the turn of the 20th century to the 1960s. Today, Dr. Cooley is speaking on Salam Bombay, Salam Tehran, pasts and presence of exchange and collaboration between India and Iranian cinemas. Please join me to welcome Dr. Cooley to the University of Toronto. Dr. Cooley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for this, that wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful lecture series. Um, I'm just going to bring up my screen. And I practiced this before, but I would still love confirmation that you can see my you screen. You can see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, so today I'm actually going to pivot a little bit from what I said. Um, I would talk about in the um, in my description um, for the talk today. Um, so actually, I'm going to look at um, exchange between Iranian uh, and, and Indian cinema through focus on the 1965 hit Iranian film Ganja Karun. Um, and so I'll look at that to untangle and to understand a bit about uh, Iranian cinema's historic and competitive relationship with Indian cinema in the mid 20th century. So in this talk today, I trace the development of a national cinema industry in Iran through what I call sound practice in order to demonstrate that film Farsi was born out of its sonic and material connections to the film industries in the Middle East and South Asia. So today in particular, India. Through a focus on sound and industry, this presentation expands Iranian cinema historiography 
beyond national frameworks and methods of textual analysis in order to understand Iranian cinema's constitutive relationship with Indian cinema. So several decades after the release of, fam of the famous uh, film by Siam Siamak Yasemi, uh, the film Ganja Karun, Karun's Treasure in English, movie star Mohammed Ali Fardin recalled the circumstances of the film's production. Fardin remembered driving with Yas Yasemi through the streets of Tehran one day in 1964 or early 1965 and passing a movie theater on Saadi Street where Raj Kapoor's enormously famous uh, popular Hindi film, Sangam, was playing. Film goers stood outside, forming a queue that Fardin uh, re recalled stretching down the street and around the block. Ostensibly, Fardin and Yasemi could hear the bustle of the excited, excited crowd, whose chatter would have mixed with the honking traffic of the busy street, causing unknowing passersby to wonder what all the fuss was about. At the side of the crowd, Yasemi sighed loudly. The director was in the early stages of planning the upcoming film, Karun's Treasure. Alluding to the long lines of people waiting to see Sangam, Yasemi exhaled and asked aloud, what needs to happen such that our films attract the same crowds? Yasemi was determined to make a film that could outperform Hindi and other foreign films at box offices in Iran. With their songs, stars, and stories, films from India had been drawing audiences to theaters for years. It took almost two decades after the coming of sound to cinema, worldwide and in the Middle East and South Asia, for Iran to be able to invest in the infrastructure needed to make sound films domestically. Throughout this time, sound films arriving in the 1950s from India, as well as Egypt, the United States, Italy, and other um, places overseas, met Iranian audiences' desires and helped to set a framework of expectations for music and dialogue. Even after films with synced sound could be made entirely in Iran, however, these films' success was tempered by the foreign films dubbed into Persian such as Sangam. Despite pressures from filmmakers, the Iranian state was in, uh, initially reluctant to adopt measures that would impede the flow of foreign films into domestic theaters. So competing with the likes of international superstar Raj Kapoor and his musical films required a strategy. Drawing on sounds heard in Egyptian or Indian as well as Egyptian films, which I um, discuss it in more detail in my larger project. So drawing on these sounds and developed in earlier Iranian commercial films, Yasemi produced the musical hit uh, Ganja Karun. With a winning combination of sounds, Karun's Treasure became one of the defining films of pre-revolution commercial Iranian cinema, film Farsi. And as Hamid Nafisi argues, it helped to establish important genre, genre conventions. Film Farsi became a common term in the 1960s, 50s to describe the emerging Iranian domestic film industry. In the 1940s, the term was also used more literally as film in Persian in the advertisement of foreign films dubbed into Persian. Film Farsi represents the sustained effort to create a strong national sound film industry in Iran. The term Film Farsi, its emergence, and films such as Qarun's Treasure tell us a great deal about the importance of sound in the historiography of film in the Middle East and South Asia, and the Iranian film industry's entanglements with networks that connected it to cinema in India, among other places. Unlike the European and North American film industries, which consolidated a decade or so before the advent of the talkies, the emergence of film industries in other co contexts is inextricably connected to the coming of sound to cinema. A focus on histories of cinematic networks between India and Iran in this sense helps us reconsider conventional ways of charting histories of film industries, such as those relying upon national frameworks. How does a focus on sound and industry in the Iranian context add dimension to how we understand film Farsi as a national cinema? Karun's Treasure was neither the first sound film made in Iran, nor the first Persian language sound film. Yet the booming success of Karun's Treasure 
represents a turning point in the emerging sound film industry and the long hoped for success of a national cinema tradition. Yet an emphasis on firsts and technological innovation per se in Iranian film histori historiography, however, has tended to obscure the significance of film Farsi and its films, such as Karun's Treasure, relative to the lore girl, Dokhtare Lor, which was made in 1933, and other Persian language films made in collaboration between Abdul Hossein Sapanta and Ardashir Irani in India. So in this presentation, I investigate Karun's treasure, its success, and its competitive relationship with Indian films such as Sangam. To do so, I attend to the sonic foundations of commercial Iranian cinema. Drawing on R. Murray Schaefer's term soundscape and Jacques Attali's theorization of noise, I foreground the roles of dubbing, music, stardom, and exchange with Indian cinema to demonstrate how film Farsi emerged through questions and concerns with sound. The concept of soundscape, as initially conceived by Schaefer, however, is largely dystopic and evaluative. He frames the soundscape as background noise that consists of unwanted sounds, such as traffic and other so-called pollutants of modern life. Instead, using the notion of soundscape, as representing the field of sounds in a particular spatio-temporal context, but avoiding Schaefer's prescriptive stance. I focus on the term to understand what Ari Kelman describes as, quote, the sonic and cultural context against or alongside of which sound emerges, end quote. Further, thinking of examples such as Yasemi's choice of characters for Karun's treasure, I consider how film constructs voices as male or female within a soundscape. As Christine Ehrich writes, quote, thinking about history in terms of gendered soundscapes can help us con conceptualize sound as a voice and voice, sorry, as a place where categories of male and female are constituted, and by extension, the ways that power, inequality, and agency it might be expressed via sound, end quote. In order to emphasize the political nature of sound, I bring Atali's views to bear on the notion of soundscape. As Atali theorizes in his political history of music, quote, noise is inscribed from the start within the panoply of power, end quote. I draw attention to the dissonances and political dimensions of certain sounds, conceived of, I argued, I argue, as noise by Iranian filmmakers and others frustrated with the success of Hindi films in the Iranian soundscape. So sonic stardom and celebrity noise, Indian cinema's prominence on, Indian, in, on Iranian screens. In Iran, international stars generated revenue and helped drive the expanding industry of film journals through the chatter sur surrounding them. The sonic presence of Raj Kapoor, Nargis, and other Indian stars through the cinema, records, and radio. Um, so through this, celebrities were also present in the Iranian soundscape through the buzz of celebrity gossip. In addition to the dubbing of foreign films, international stars generated revenue and helped drive the expanding industry of film journals in Iran through gossip about stars that covered a range of controversial subjects and scandals. The way that gossip framed male and female performance, performers differently is one example of the gendering of the soundscape. In 1954, Raj Kapoor visited Tehran to promote the Persian language version of Avara, or The Vagabond in 1951 a film which Setare Cinema would ultimately deem the best of the year. So Setare Cinema, this Iranian magazine, deemed this Hindi film the best of the year, despite the magazine's presence in Iran and its prevailing focus on Hollywood. The groundwork for Avara's Persian language reception had been laid years earlier when it was shown in the original Hindi and met with fame despite its lack of, sub, of, dub, of dubbing or subtitles. Kapoor's 1956 visit to Tehran was the subject of considerable attention from fans and the press. 
Throughout his stay, people in the streets neighboring his hotel excitedly chanted his name. An interview in Cetare Cinema captured Kapoor's views on cinema at the time, including how he viewed his work within the context of the region. Kapoor indicated an interest in Iranian co-production and suggested with, um, right, so Iranian co-production between Iran and India, and suggested that Hindi and Iranian films taken together drew attention to shared customs. Acknowledging the close ties between cinema in the Middle East and South Asia, Kapoor noted that he aspired to create films appropriate for and appealing to everyone in what he called Asia. When asked about Hollywood film stars who have been popular in Iran for years, Kapoor acknowledged a lack of exposure to their names and to their films. In the course of this interview, Kapoor characterizes his work as regional, transnational, and implicitly not Hollywood-centric. Kapoor's stance aligns with, the, aligns with the larger context of the Iranian film industry's close interactions with its neighbors. Um, so Setare Cinema, also around this time, was um, very interested in the goings about of the famous Hindi film star Nargis, who we see here on, the, on a cover. And then also there's a, um, here is a feature on Nargis that includes a self-portrait and information about her life and the fact that at one point she wanted to study medicine, but her, um, the, the sort of manager at the college said she was too slight of, or weak of character to study medicine and she was better off with um, mm -hmm. music. But in any case, like Raj Kapoor, Nargis was also a, um, a uh, huge focus of attention in the Iranian um, film press. Um, yet, despite all of this, the success of Indian musicals and their stars in Iran was not always cast positively in Iran's soundscape. Kapoor may have viewed his cinema as regional and transnational, and so um, and open to ideas of co-production, but sound and gossip framed him as a dis dis disreputable outsider. So scandal is a hallmark of the global celebrity machine. In the case of Raj Kapoor in India, scandal was mobilized to serve nationalization and racialization, as well as to position him as a lecherous male star encroaching on Iran's actresses. Talk about Kapoor in this sense was not mere gossip. Rather, news about the star's visits to Iran was presented as what Atalif theorizes as noise in the soundscape, disrupting the integrity of Iran's female, female stars. So for instance, um, in 1958, Kapoor returned to Iran to attend the first screening of his film, Shri 420. As before, magazines and trade papers were eager to report on his exploits. Yet instead of celebrating his return to Iran, an article in Setare Cinema focused on Kapoor's wild nights on the town with several Iranian actresses, including Irene Asemi and Puran Shapuri. The author of the article detailed the group's antics, including an alleged affair between Kapoor and Asemi. Ultimately, the author accuses the actresses of being insecure for seemingly throwing themselves at the star. And the journalist even claims to have a scandalous photo of an uncontrollable Kapoor and an actress referred to only by the first letter of her name, Sheen. So the uh, picture here on the slide um, comes from this article. In the photo, the journalist claims both appear intoxicated with Sheen wearing only her underwear. Desperate, Sheen is said to have called the journalist and said, sir, I will give you 500 tomans if you do not publish the photo. The, def the defamatory article posits the gossip, talk, and other sounds generated by film imports and their in attendant stars in Iran as noise in a way that recalls the work of Jacques Attali. Attali's con conception of music and noise introduces notions of power, economy, and difference to a potentially neutral soundscape. He argues that, quote, listening to music is listening to all noise, realizing that it, its appropriation and control is a reflection of power. That is, uh, that is 
that it is essentially political, end quote. Previously, the sounds of celebrity gossip in Iran framed Kapoor as a director who played a diplomatic role. But in this case, the talk that Kapoor generates is cast as noise. Through his inappropriate interactions with Iranian female stars and their putative inability to control themselves around him and the films with which he is associated, Kapoor represents a threat to the manner in which the Iranian soundscape is gendered. The noise that Kapoor generated in celebrity magazines was connected to the grumblings of Iranian filmmakers who had to compete with hugely successful Hindi films. By the early to mid 1960s, Yasemi was not the only one frustrated with the popularity of Hindi language cinema among Iranian audiences. For years, film magazines had devoted sections to reflecting on the state of the Iranian film industry and its need for improvement. Throughout the 1950s, readers were asked to share their opinions on Iranian films, and editors wrote articles in which they suggested ways to make the industry better. Apart from issues of technology and style, Iranian films suffered from a basic lack of government support. In 1961, a group of filmmakers and producers approached the state seeking to con constitute a commission on commercial cinema to protect and boost the struggling industry. And you can see um, one page of this commission. Observing measures that had been taken by Egypt, Turkey, India, and Pakistan to protect and foster their industries, the commission suggested reducing taxes and removing other financial obstacles that hindered film production in Iran. Such a move, it argued, would improve the quality of domestic films and bring them into fairer competition with imports, while also priming them for export markets. Strengthening the industry, the argument went, would stop the flow of Iranian money to its neighbors. It would also end the dominance of foreign films whose content was believed to be unsuited to Iranian sensibilities, national spirit, and morals. The establishment of the commission points to sound in film Farsi as not just a matter of financial gain, but as important to national pride. As such, Indian uh, film imports, as well as those from Egypt and other places, but in this presentation I'm focusing on India, represented noise in the Iranian soundscape that threatened to corrupt Iranian sensibilities and morals. Yasemi's groundbreaking Karun's treasure illustrates these national tensions of the industry within the text of the film itself. So through consideration of Karun's treasure and Kapoor's Sangam together and the ways in which sound casts its stars, I frame in the next section, efforts to strengthen commercial Iranian sound cin cinema as a nationalist attempt to silence the transnational sounds that were crucial to film Farsi's development. Okay, so Karun's treasure versus Sangam, the contending masculinities and nationalities of Mohammed Bardin and Raj Kapoor. So in 1964, Kapoor set records in Iran with the epic Sangam, which had an, an unprecedented run of more than 17 weeks in Iranian theaters. And it was, um, so we can think about the um, scene that I set at the beginning of this presentation when I was talking about uh, Fardin and Yasemi driving in the car, seeing crowds um, excitedly waiting to see Sangam in theaters. So Kapoor's first film in Technicolor, Sangam is almost a four hour melodrama with famous songs performed by Lata Mangeshkar, Mukesh and Mohammed Rafi. For months, Sangam was unstoppable until it was dethroned by Karun's treasure in 1965. Karun's treasure did not just supersede Sangam at the box office. It uses sound to effectively disavow the transnational connections between the two films. By affirming idealized national codes of masculinity and femininity in the boy bodies and voices of its actors, Karun's treasure attempts a break from Hindi cinema as a whole. Given Sangam's per stellar performance at the box office, Yasemi was aware of what he was up against in planning for Karun's treasure. 
Yasemi initially envisioned, however, that the film would star a trio of comedic actors. Mohamed Moteb Vaselani, Mansour Sepernia, and Garshab Raufi, who were famous for their antics and dynamics together. However, reflecting on the success of his 1964 film, Algaya Karne Bistom, Man of the 20th Century, um, Yasemi changed his mind. He thought of the film's distinctly Iranian themes, songs, and superstar, Bardeen, and how they had drawn audiences to theaters. In contrast to the comedic actors Yasemi was considering, Fardin had sex appeal. Having started his career as a wrestling champion, Fardin embodied contemporary codes of, ide of ideal masculinity in Iran. He was a heartthrob who exemplified the tough guy figure that, in conjunction with its historic roots in Iranian society, had more recently found articulation and idealization in Iranian cinema. In addition to casting Fardin with his athletic body, Yasemi also needed to find a voice that sonically encapsulated the tough guy figure. In Qarun's treasure, Fardin's athletic physique and good looks were complemented sonically by the deep singing voice of singer Iraj and baritone speaking voice of dub actor Cengiz Jaliband. Yasemi cast Bombshell and budding starlet Forozan alongside Fardin. As with Fardin, Yasemi's pairing of Forozan's curvaceous and often scantily clad body with the soft soprano of a dubbing performer was informed by a particular idealized sense of femininity. It also indicated a shift from the more complex gender representations that had been present in Iranian cinema, such as those conveyed by the singer Del Kash. After first becoming famous in Iran through the circulation of her singing on records and radio, Del Kash starred in several domestically produced sound films in the 1950s. She was known for her deep androgynous voice and the gender bonding role she played, such as the Luti tough guy figure in several of her films. Yasemi's decision to emphasize typically Iranian themes and tropes proved successful. Karun's treasure shattered box office records, ultimately outperforming Sangam to become the most popular and highest grossing film in Iran up until that point. A shift from the genre films of the previous decade, Karun's treasure includes themes and narrative strategies reminiscent of Hindi films, such as the double identity of the main character, Ali Karun, played by Fardin and Changiz Jaliband. With the entrenchment of the star system in, the 19, in 1940s India, Hindi cinema directors often cast a single character to play double or multiple roles in the same film. In its incorporation of several elements typical of Hindi films, Karun's treasure in many ways beat Sangam at its own game. It was estimated to have been seen by 80,000 of Tehran's 1 million residents. Arun's treasure distinguishes itself from films like Sangam by featuring actors such as Fardin with a particular physical pre presence. Yet the film con converses with Sangam in the way it notably engages with India and draws on several tropes common in Hindi cinema. Karun's treasure tells the story of a well-known rich man named Karun who left his wife and son many years earlier and is now in the twilight years of his life. Despite his wealth and relative fame, Karun is unhappy and sick, and his despondence has led him to decide to commit suicide. After he throws himself off a bridge in Esfahan, two passersby save Karun from drowning. These two friends, a man named Hassan the Rattler and Carefree Ali, bring Karun to Ali's mother's home where they eat abgusht, a traditional Iranian stew, and Ali sings a popular song. Karun, having found friends, now decides to masquerade as Ismail the Brainless and join Hassan and Ali in their uh, activities around Asfahan. In an explicit way, Karun's treasure cites Bombay cinema by featuring a character from India in its narrative. While Ali, 
Ismail and Hassan are spending time together, Shirin, the rich daughter of the Zayr Paras family, has rejected the suitor that her family has chosen for her in a wealthy neighborhood of Esfahan. Shirin con co concocts a story telling her mother and father that she has met the son of famous wealthy Karun, who she says has been living in India, and they plan to get married as soon as Karun travels to Tehran. Later, while frantically driving around Esfahan after breaking the news to her parents and trying to, figuring out what, trying to figure out what to do, Shireen co coincidentally runs into Hassan, Esmail, and Ali. Shireen tells the three men of her predicament and they agree to help her. Ali pretends to be Karun's son, who has in fact, who has grown up in India and meets Shireen's parents later at the Hilton. But little does anyone know at the time, Ali is in fact Karun's long lost son, a fantastical plot twist that is revealed at the end of the film and that resonates with patterns of Bombay cinema and other global melodramas. Karun's treasure draws on Iranian audiences and previous engagements with voices in Hindi films, either with Iranian dub artists or with the or original Hindi dialogue through its focus on accent. To play the part of the rich son, who has grown up in India when meeting Shirin's parents, Ali dons what the film suggests to be the accent of a Hindi speaker. Hassan pretends to be his interpreter since Karun's son can understand but cannot speak Persian. Shirin's father remarks, I didn't know that Persian and Hindi were so similar that I would so easily understand. But her mother answers, no dear, it's because Karun's son is educated. Despite the familiarity and popularity of Hindi films in Iran, as well as the fact that the film draws on tropes in Bombay cinema, India is reduced to tropes in a place that uh, tropes in a place that is foreign, unfamiliar, and in need of translation. Karun's treasure engages India thematically through the character of Karun's son, and stylistically in drawing on tropes popular in Hindi cinema, such as the double character. The double character of Ali, Karun's son in Karun's treasure, can be heard as the story of our, a competition between Hindi cinema and film Farsi. Karun's fake son is a wealthy man from India who has come back to Iran to marry the daughter of a rich family. Rich, educated, and the son of the famous Karun, he occupies an enviable position. Yet through his fake accent, the film clearly mocks him. Ali, meanwhile, comes from a working class background, is uneducated, and likely would not have been invited to the Hilton to meet Shireen's parents were he not masquerading as Karun's rich son. As the film draws to a close, Ali discovers that his father is the wealthy Karun. He and Shireen fall in love and all live happily ever after. And in the end, Ali, the character who is representative of a typically authentic Iranianness, prevails. By connecting Ali's double character and the relationship between Bombay cinema and film Farsi, this ending shatters the myth of the wealthy son, or in this actor, who comes from India to win the heart of the desired daughter, or in this case, audience member. Karun's treasure uses sound and accent to narrate the competition of film Farsi and Indian cinema in order to seduce the ears of the Iranian audiences. So in the Iranian, in the Indian, or sorry, in the American context, uh, scholar Shilpa S. Dave theorizes, quote, the performance of accent is a means of representing race and particularly national origin beyond visual identification, end quote. Although discussing Indian accents in the US entertainment media specifically, she notes how the notion of a, quote, accent is inherently comparative. Accents appear only in comparison to normal or standard speech. Accent can mark or distinguish someone or something in relation to someone else, end quote. The formation that Dave discusses are different from the dynamics as formulated by Karun's treasure. In contrast to Hollywood, this context involves a small regional cinema engaging with a global powerhouse like Bombay cinema. Yet a hierarchy is being established in the sense that Karun's treasure uses accent as a means to mark India and Indian cinema as different. 
The film uses an Indian accent to emphasize the authenticity of Iranian speech and cinema. Uh, yeah. Dave notes how, quote, accent is a socially constructed reality, similar to the idea of race as a socially constructed system of difference in hierarchy, end quote. So for example, in one scene, Karun's son does a dance to, high, to laughing and interesting onlookers and sings, I have come from India, I have come from India. I'll show a quick quote of this. <laughs> So this and other scenes that feature the character of Karun's son work to place India on a particular level within Iran's racial formation. Although this film might not overtly mock India, the film tries to establish through sound a dynamic in which India seems inferior. The teasing and putting on of accents connects to Iranian dubbing practices in which dub artists would adopt certain voices depending on the character they were sonically representing. One particular scene in the film encapsulates tensions between sound, accent, and gender and underscores the film's use of sound to delineate national and gender identity in its engagement with Sangam. It was actually likely inspired by a similar scene in Sangam in which female protagonist Radha is making fun of her husband Sundar, played by Raj Kapoor, and demonstrating her power over him. So singing lines such as, quote, what would I do with, what should I do with my old man? Radha dances sensually for Sundar in their Paris hotel room and goes through several sexy costume changes. In the par parallel scene in Karun's treasure, Shirin dances for Ali and similarly undergoes several costume changes. Finally alone, so I'm gonna show a clip of the film, but set it up quickly. Finally alone together one afternoon while hanging out poolside at Shireen's family house, Shireen admits her love for Ali, but Ali does not reciprocate her feelings and instead expresses disgust with Shireen's bathing outfit. Suggesting that she put on something more appropriate, he dives into the pool. Shireen disappears inside her parents' house to change clothes. <laughs> With a switch from black and white to color and with a flourish of orchestra, Shireen reemerges on the patio. For the next eight minutes in the film's only scene in color, Shireen performs for Ali weaving together songs and dance scenes that are dances that are characteristic of Indian cinemas at the time, as well as other popular films in Iran, such as those from Hollywood and Egypt. Imitating Indian cinema with exaggerating ac exaggerated accented singing, dance moves and costumes, Shireen dons a sari and sings in a Hindi accent to seduce Ali. <laughs> I'm gonna see you, 
As we've seen, scoffs at Shirin as she's doing this dance, covering his ears and diving under the water so he does not have to hear her. Yet, when Shirin emerges wearing a fedora hat, typical of the Iranian luti tough guy character, and does the uniquely Iranian Baba Karam dance, Ali stops ignoring her. Captivated by and now attracted to Shirin, Ali dances along. As we have seen, the sonic landscape of this colorful scene is seductive and the spectacular audiovisual experience articulates the female body, desire, and national culture. It suggests what an attractive and respectable woman should look and sound like. Through Shirin's singing, dancing, and costume changes, the scene casts the female body and voice as a producer of sound and spectacle, as well as a purveyor of national culture. In her performance as the tough guy, Shirin sonically nods to classical Iranian singers such as Del Kash and other aspects of a gender-bending musical tradition. But Shirin's coy singing and tight dress reinforce an emerging ideal feminine voice out of sync with female singers such as Del Kash. The femininity of Shirin and other contemporaneous stars and film characters reflect the normalization of of man woman bi gender binary in the 20th in Iran in the 20th century. Zardine similarly embodies these modern codes of masculinity. Although the scene positions him as judge of music, accent and dance and and ideal feminine bod female body in his role as spectator and consumer of Shirin's performance, he is also sexualized. By ignoring Shirin, Ali has the opportunity to display his physique and athleticism to the viewer as he swims in Shirin's family's pool. Ali's position in the scene contrasts sharply with that of Kapoor as Sundar in the parallel scene in Sangam. While sound casts Radha as commanding and powerful, it positions Sundar as pathetic and old. In Karun's treasure, meanwhile, sound emerges as dynamic and electrified, as it provides an affective space through which gender and sexuality are negotiated. In addition to providing a space for flaunting technology and sexy bodies, national identity is also established through the sonic. Shirin's playful, playful reference to Egyptian and Indian dance sequences in the films and the use of accents in the scene and others Directly, directly acknowledges the pre presence of Indian commercial sound films and other sonic media and the commercial Iranian soundscape at, um, leading up to this time. In the way that the scene echoes similar instances of doubled characters and rapid shifts in dancing styles in Hindi cinema, this scene continues to draw on Iranian spectators inside knowledges, uh, knowledge of uh, Hindi cinema that is constructed throughout the film. Karun's treasure also indexes Hindi cinema and announces the importance of Shirin and her various dances through its use of color. The film's transition to color follows the lead of its soundscape. The scene's dazzling use of the color technology visually highlights Shirin's body and voice as promoting an ideal female and national identity. In addition, color serves to demonstrate that Iranian films can have stunning spectacles like Sangam and other films of Bombay cinema especially considering that Iranian films were mostly produced in black and white in the 1960s. Color turns up the visual volume of the film at the point at which sound 
uh, which sounds reminiscent of Indian, as well as, as I explained in my larger project, Egyptian and um, other national cinemas are sonically highlighted and cast as noise. Shirin's fake accents and exaggerated dance moves indicate noise in the soundscape across Indian, uh, Iranian, and oh, sorry, across Egyptian, Iranian, and Indian cinemas, despite these cinemas and other media's sonic indebtedness to each other and wide fan bases that did not adhere to national borders. Tensions manifested in sonic negotiations of gender and racial identities worked to assert a particular dynamic between these media centers. Shirin's teasing invocation of different voices, sounds, and performances to seduce Ali and Ali's impressions of a wealthy man from India indicates the role of sound in the film's demarcation of gendered and national identities in the Iranian soundscape. In identifying the ideal man and woman in a national, particular national space, the scene reveals sound and listening as an available, available technology of racial, ethnic, and gender classification. Ali and Shirin's voices, and as encoded by their sound, bo their bodies, as encoded by sound, their bodies, provide sites of mediating class, national identity, race, gender, and sexuality, and prove useful in understanding these technologies, imbrication in the gendering and racializing of sounds at the time. Qarun's treasure set in crucial genre precedents for film Farsi. In later interviews, Fardin shared re revealing stories about the production of the film with a focus on its sonic elements, such as the fact that he had made up, he himself had made up the Indian dance in the scene I showed you earlier in which he performs as Qarun's son. In order to make it look like he was realistically singing as Iraj, Fardin notes how he had to practice to lip sync with Iraj's words. Film scenes, he said, were often ruined because a person couldn't match the movement of his or her lips to a singer's voice. When asked why Qarun's treasure was so successful, Fardin noted its star-studded cast and the choice of poetry, songs, and the voice of Iraj. But more importantly, and more significantly, he noted the film's importance for establishing a national cinema. Quote, we weren't inheritors of a cinema. We didn't have a cinema that was local or national before Qarun's treasure, end quote. Fardin's comments demonstrate the integral place of Qarun's treasure in an Iranian film industry, in Iranian film history, and the notion that Iranian cinema was dominated and heavily influenced by other cinemas such as Hindi cinema until the film's release. So Fardin's relationship with Indian cinema would remain contradictory. In 1972, he starred in Indian-Iranian co-production Homaye Sadat, Bluebird of Happiness, Suba Hosham, which is the uh, Hindi name. Um, and this film uh, is one that Samhita Shunya brilliantly discusses in a chapter in her forthcoming book. Um, and um, so she argues that this film celebrated the friendship between the Iranian and Indian fil film industries through the narratives of its hero, which was played by Fardin, and heroine played by Indian film actress Wahida Rahman. But it's interesting to me, um, his appearance, appearance in this co-production, considering the fact that he continued to remain very concerned about Indian as well as Egyptian films competition with Iranian films. And at one point grew mad that a group of, um, that a group of theaters called Asia Group, from what I could um, gather, if anyone actually has information on Asia Group, I would be grateful. Um, so the fact that this group had decided to screen Indian and Egyptian films that was in a theater, especially reserved for Iranian films. And he, I guess, wasn't able to put a, he wasn't able to put a stop to this because he was away in England at the time. Um, in Film Honar and Setare Cinema, I have only seen this co-production, um, Sadat, mentioned in passing, um, despite consistent and devoted coverage by these magazines of, so er, Fardin and his film. So it's interesting, despite this focus on Fardin, Homaya Sadat wouldn't have received the same amount of coverage, especially because one of the mentions that appear in Setare Cinema um, uh, includes um, 
that uh, a profile of Fardin in a 1976 issue of Setari Cinema, in which he explained that he, um, he at that point, so in 1976, had received his highest salary ever as an actor in his role in this Iranian Indian co-production, um, which had occurred approximately four years earlier. Um, and so that would have his, um, uh, the salary was 45 million real. Um, so just kind of to conclude and sort of to think about, you know, next step for thinking about these exchanges between Iranian and Indian cinemas, you know, more explicit kind of co-productions are really interesting and important for understanding moments of cinematic traffic between Iranian, Iran and India. But Karun's treasure kind of shows us a different um, dimension of these exchanges in the fact that it is less it is less kind of explicit and kind of seeing what were the factors that led to um, its production. So I'll stop there. I know that I have talked longer than I said I would. Um, and thank you very much for listening and sharing your Friday afternoon with me.